Hi, I'm Ingra Tovanason. And I'm Liliana Thelmova. And we're PhD students at the University of Cambridge. Welcome to episode four of Black Hole Wars, Return of the Information. In this episode, we're going to learn about the different possible ways to solve the black hole information paradox, which you would have heard about in previous episodes. Suppose you're on a journey through space. You decide to fly close to a star and throw some rocks at it. Every time a, ro a rock falls into the star, its mass increases and it grows in size. Eventually, the star grows so large and it, that it is unable to support its own gravitational field and it collapses into a black hole. Yeah, let, let's say that you decide to take some photographs of this strange object, but then disaster strikes. You accidentally drop your camera into the black hole. You're obviously very unhappy about this because there are a lot of photos on the camera of your journey through the universe. Those photos contain a lot of information about all the things that you have seen. You really want to recover your photos and the information they contain. But according to all the physics you think you know, nothing can escape a black hole. We used to think that black holes exist forever once they are formed, and without the strangeness of quantum mechanics, this would be true. But Stephen Hawking's most famous calculation showed that quantum effects will cause the black hole to emit energy in the form of so-called Hawking radiation. This process happens very slowly, but eventually the black hole will lose so much energy that it disappears completely. This is called black hole evaporation. Hawking's calculation also seems to suggest that the Hawking radiation doesn't contain any of the information that fell into the black hole. So after the black hole has disappeared, all the information seems to have vanished, and all your photos. This is the black hole information paradox. However, is the information actually gone for good? Are your photos lost forever? Or is the information somehow still out there? And if so, where is it? There are a lot of different possible answers to these questions, and we don't really know the answer. However, here to tell us about some kind of different possibilities is Josh Kirklin, who is a researcher at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Take it away, Josh. Great. Thanks for having me. When Stephen Hawking discovered the information paradox, he posed a hugely important question. What happens to the information that falls into a black hole? Almost 50 years of intense uh, theoretical physics thinking has, has followed, and although we seem to be getting closer, we still don't have a definitive answer to this question. Let's explore some of the proposals. Option number one. Black holes don't evaporate. Maybe Hawking's calculation was wrong, and black holes don't emit any radiation after all. Then there wouldn't really be a problem. Any information that we sent into a black hole would just remain there forever. But it wouldn't be destroyed. We could always go inside of the black hole and just take a look at it. Um, this wouldn't be any different to putting the information inside of a very secure bank vault. Really though, physicists don't take this idea very seriously. You may have heard that we don't know how to combine the equations that describe quantum mechanics with the ones that describe gravity. And this is true, but only up to a point. There are certain situations where we can combine the equations, and we'll get accurate predictions. The calculation that Hawking did, which uh, showed that Hawking radiation uh, is emitted by black holes, exploited this fact. Many physicists have tried to find faults in his mathematics, but so far Hawking's calculations have proven airtight, and all of the attempts to find faults in them seem to have failed. It appears to be inevitable that the black hole will emit Hawking radiation. Option number two, information is lost. One way to resolve the puzzle, and Hawking's first instinct, was to conclude that black holes genuinely destroy information. This seemed like the obvious answer to many theoretical physicists at the time. Hawking discovered that black holes uh, emit Hawking radiation in 1976. The black holes themselves were first proposed almost 200 years earlier, in 1793, by John Mitchell, as objects from which light cannot escape. Then, around 120 years later, 
Einstein came up with his theories of relativity, which said that light is the fastest thing around. So if light cannot escape a black hole, then nothing else ought to be able to either. For so many decades, this was the defining feature that made black holes so important. So why shouldn't it apply to information as well? Once it enters a black hole, perhaps it can never get out. Then, when the black hole disappears, so too does the information. But there are various reasons why this isn't satisfying to many physicists. For one, it would be very unusual. As far as we know, no other objects in physics seem to destroy information. But maybe this is okay. After all, black holes are unusual objects in other ways as well. However, there are more absolute reasons to reject this possibility. For example, one consequence of quantum mechanics is that all kinds of tiny particles and objects are constantly coming into and out of existence, and this includes black holes. These objects are called virtual because they live for such a short period of time. If all of these tiny virtual black holes were to destroy information when they disappear, this would mean that information is lost at a steady rate everywhere in space all the time. And in thermodynamics, the study of heat, the loss of information is the same as the production of something called entropy. And when entropy is produced, things tend to heat up. So Josh, uh, I know about entropy and how that relates to temperature, but why is it that um, information loss leads to temperature increase? This is the River Cam in Cambridge. Let's zoom into the water in this river so that we can see all of the molecules close up. If the water is hot, all the molecules in the water move about very quickly and bump into each other. And this makes it very difficult to guess where any one molecule might be located at any particular time. That's sort of the same as saying that we have very little information about the molecule's location. On the other hand, if we cool down the water, the water molecules move more slowly and bump into each other less. And this makes it easy to guess where they might be located, and so we have more information. This is actually a really deep property of thermodynamics. When something is very hot, it is very hard to guess what state it's in, so we have very little information. Whereas if something is colder, then it's easier to make guesses about it, so we have more information. In fact, this connection between heat and information works the other way around as well. Okay, yeah, so, so now we know that if um, we have more information, then that causes something to become colder, and, uh, and the other way around, the less information uh, something has, the hotter it becomes. So in the case of the universe, if black holes destroy information, it will become hotter, and... Yes, that's exactly right. Virtual black holes are always forming and evaporating everywhere in space. And if they destroy information in the way that Hawking thought, then space would heat up. And in fact, calculations have shown that space would increase in temperature by 10 to the power of 20 degrees in a fraction of a second. Clearly, we don't observe this. For this reason, and several others, most physicists today would probably disagree with the idea that information is really lost in a black hole. But a significant number still do maintain this belief, and Hawking himself was an advocate of this point of view for many years, although he did eventually change his mind. So we should not reject it outright. However, from here on in this talk, we'll assume that black holes do not destroy information, uh, and try to understand the possible ways in which this could happen. Option number three is remnants. I've told you that Stephen Hawking's calculation of the properties of Hawking radiation should be completely valid, since in the case of black holes, we know how to combine the equations describing quantum mechanics with the ones describing gravity. However, technically speaking, this is actually only true when the black hole is bigger than something called the Planck length. 
which is about 10 to the power of minus 26 nanometers. This is really, really small. To get an idea of just how small, consider a human red blood cell. The width of a typical red blood cell is about 10 to the power of minus 5 meters. On the other hand, the observable universe is about 10 to the power of 27 meters wide. So clearly a red blood cell takes up a really tiny proportion of the universe. A Planck length takes up about the same amount of space in a red blood cell that the red blood cell takes up in the entire universe. All of the black holes we've observed, using things like gravitational waves, are much, much larger than a Planck length. But if black holes shrink, uh, which they must do if they emit Hawking radiation, then they must eventually reach this tiny size. And after that point, we don't actually have any idea what will happen. One possibility is that it will just continue to exist forever as a tiny, tiny little particle called a remnant. One of the earliest suggestions for how the information paradox could be resolved is that such a remnant is left over, and all of the information that went into the black hole stays inside of the remnant. If this were true, the remnant would have uh, infinite information capacity, uh, because we could have thrown any arbitrary amount of information into the black hole that we started with. If the remnant were a USB stick, it would have infinity gigabytes worth of storage capacity, while at the same time being really, really small. Um, but hang on, if uh, what we said before is true, that the destruction of information is heating up the universe, then wouldn't the creation of information storage capacity by virtual black holes cool down the universe by an absurd amount in a very small amount of time? That's right. As we said before, in quantum mechanics, virtual objects are constantly coming into and out of existence, and this would include these infinite information capacity black hole remnants. But like before, this leads to another big problem. Whereas tiny black holes that destroy information would create huge amounts of unobserved heat in the universe, these uh, black hole remnants would instead suck all of the heat out of the universe. Uh, cooling it down to absolute zero, incredibly quickly. We don't observe this happening either. Option number four is baby universes. Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that space-time isn't rigid. Like the surface of the river Cam, it is always rippling and moving about, It can warp and bend in strange and unexpected ways, leading to the formation of objects like black holes. But it can also do even weirder things. For example, one part of the universe could warp so violently that a piece of it breaks off entirely. This is like if I scooped some of the water in the river into a cup. After this happens, for all intents and purposes, the broken off piece the, the water in the cup is a completely new universe, independent of the original one. This new universe is called a baby universe. So maybe this is what happens to the black hole. Here's the universe, bending and rippling. When a black hole forms, it pushes a big dimple into the universe, and then when it evaporates, the dimple flattens out. But maybe, before the black hole disappears completely, everything that went inside it breaks off into a baby universe. Then the black hole can disappear in the original universe, but the baby universe and the information it contains continues to exist. Another analogy could make this easier to understand. Imagine that the outside and the inside of the black hole are two rooms in a building, connected by a long corridor. If the roof of the corridor collapses in, so it becomes filled with rocks and, and other debris, it will become blocked off, 
so that nothing can pass through it. And the two rooms are then effectively disconnected. Someone in the outside room can't talk with someone in the inside room, but that doesn't mean that the person in the inside room has uh, has has stopped existing. So just this is a really cool idea. However, if the black holes in the original universe collapses and the baby universe is completely inaccessible, how does it actually solve the information paradox? Well, actually, it probably doesn't solve the paradox. Um, we as observers are stuck in the original universe, so there's no way for us to measure uh, or do experiments on the information in the baby universe. So, from our perspective, which is all that really matters, the results of this baby universe splitting off are exactly the same as if the information is destroyed. And that means that all of the problems that apply to the loss of information, like the universe heating up too much, also apply to this baby universe proposal. Option number five is called black hole hair. For quite a long time, it was thought that you only need three numbers to describe a black hole. Its mass, its electric charge, and its angular momentum, or how quickly it's spinning. The physicist John Wheeler used a strange analogy for this. The story goes that he said that we tend to recognize people by their hairstyles, which can have a lot of little details. But black holes lack any of these details, so he said that black holes have no hair. The name stuck, and this feature of black holes came to be known as the no-hair theorem. Just to be clear, this is only a metaphor. When we say hair, we're not actually talking about physical strands or something. It's just the, the name given to features that distinguish the black hole. Remember that black holes are formed when stars collapse under their own gravity. And well, unlike black holes, we know that stars do have hair. For example, stars are approximately spherical, but they can be slightly squished or they can wobble in different ways. We also observe interesting features like sunspots and solar flares on our own star, the sun. Here are some videos of those. Black holes have none of these features. They're very smooth, featureless, round objects. The fact that black holes appear to have no hair is one of the reasons why the information paradox has been so hard to solve. If black holes did have hair, then this could be a way for information to be preserved. It could be that any information that seems to have entered the black hole is actually deposited in the hairstyle. For example, it might make the black hole wobble in a certain way. The hair should be observable to someone on the outside, provided they know where to look. So if this were true, it would mean that the information never actually entered the black hole in the first place, it just remained on the outside, in the hair. So if it turns out that black holes have hair, and we worked out how to actually read the hair in the same way we know how to read a book, then we would know what information the, the black holes contain, and hence the information would not be lost forever. Right, and for this reason there have been many attempts to get around the no-hair theorem, and show that black holes actually do have hair. This was, for example, one of the last things that Stephen Hawking worked on. But not all of these attempts at finding black hole hair have succeeded, and really not everyone agrees that any of them have. Let's suppose that every option we've discussed isn't true. So, black holes evaporate, they don't destroy information, they don't leave remnants, they, they don't leave baby universes, and they don't have hair. So, if none of these are true, does this mean that we're out of ideas, and that black holes really do destroy information? No, there is in fact still one possibility left standing. The information could be carried out by the Hawking radiation when the black hole evaporates. When the information paradox was proposed in 1976, this was one of the least popular of the potential resolutions. But over time, opinions changed. I want to show you the results of a poll of black hole physicists 
taken by Joe Pulchinski in 1993, a decade and a half later, at a physics conference in Santa Barbara, California. The question was, what happens to information that falls into a black hole? And this is a photo of the whiteboard on which he tallied the result. As you can see, information is lost, had significant support, but information comes out with Hawking radiation came out on top. So in 1993, many physicists thought that the Hawking radiation had to contain the information. But it's far from obvious how this is supposed to happen, and in the rest of the talk, we're going to discuss some possibilities. So Josh, you talk about the information leaving the black hole. However, we already mentioned that nothing like not even light can escape black hole and from a special relativity we know that nothing can move faster than life. So how can anything, even information, escape the black hole through the radiation? One possibility is that just before entering the black hole the information is cloned. Imagine that there's a photocopier on the edge of the black hole. When a bit of information goes past the photocopier, it's duplicated, resulting in two copies. One of these goes into the black hole, eventually spiraling into the singularity in the middle and burning up. But the other piece hollows just outside of the horizon, and eventually it, it surfs on the waves of Hawking radiation emanating from the black hole and is carried back out to where we can see it. In this way, we'd be able to get back any information that we threw at the black hole. So, uh, the information never actually escapes the black holes, but it's sent out to the outside observer just before the, any object falls into the black hole. Exactly. The information that the observer ends up seeing never actually fell into the black hole, so it never had to escape it either. Of course, there isn't really an actual photocopier outside the black hole. Instead, there would have to be some mysterious process that does this copying. But Josh, uh, I know from uh, quantum physics that you can't copy uh, the information. There's a, um, a rule in quantum physics known as uh, technically as the no cloning theorem. And this says that copying this information would therefore be impossible. So how do we resolve this? Unfortunately for this idea, you're correct. Quantum mechanics is governed by mathematical rules and equations, and we're not allowed to break any of those rules under any circumstances. One of the rules is called the no-cloning theorem, as you say, and it forbids us from doing any kind of duplication of information. This means that a photocopier at the horizon of the black hole appears to contradict the rules that underlie reality. So it seems this can't be the answer. Things get slightly weird at this point. I've just told you that an exact quantum photocopier can't exist. But actually, it, it turns out that there maybe can be a photocopier if we're allowed to think about things in a certain way. Suppose the bit of information has been duplicated at the horizon, one copy goes in and the other stays outside. This seems to violate the no-cloning theorem. But how could we verify that it actually does? we'd need to collect both bits of information and confirm that they're exact copies of each other. We'll need at least two people to carry out this experiment. Physicists like to call these people Alice and Bob, but uh, instead I'll call them Angaran and Biljana. Unfortunately for Angaran, his task is to enter the black hole and to collect the copy of the information that actually fell inside of it. On the other hand, Beliana is lucky enough to remain outside of the black hole, where all she needs to do is find the copy of the information that didn't fall inside. Then, Aingaran and Beliana need to meet up and compare their copies of the information. But can they actually do this? Aingaran can't ever leave the black hole, so they can't do their comparison on the outside. This means they can only meet up inside the black hole. So it turns out Beliana has to enter the black hole after all. 
but there's a problem with meeting on the inside as well. At the center of every black hole is a point called the singularity. Anyone inside of the black hole is doomed to fall into the singularity, where they'll be stretched and twisted into pieces, uh, meeting their unfortunate demise. Clearly, Angaran and Biliana will need to convene before this happens to either of them. So if Biliana is too slow at finding the bit of the information on the outside, she won't be able to find Angaran on the inside before he burns up. And it turns out that this will always be the case. In particular, there's a calculation that can be done which shows that it will always take Biliana too long to find the outside piece of information. No matter how quick she tries to be, she'll never be able to reach Angaran on the inside before he perishes. She'd have to travel faster than light to do so, uh, and that's impossible. The inevitable conclusion is that although Angaran and Biliana can individually collect the two copies of the information, they cannot afterwards meet up, not outside of the black hole and not inside of it either. This means that they're never able to compare the two copies, so they can't actually tell that there's a contradiction of the no cloning theorem. So the situation is as follows. Any photocopier on the horizon which duplicates the information would uh, break the rules of quantum mechanics. It would violate the no cloning theorem. But there isn't actually an experiment that would be able to see that contradiction. Does this mean that there's no contradiction at all? After all, science is based on observation and experiment. And if there's no observation that can see a contradiction, then maybe this is the same as there being no contradiction at all. This idea has been given the name black hole complementarity. But Josh, I'm a bit confused because uh, we said that um, we, we know that in physics, like as you said, that we want to be able to observe these theories that we've got. And um, this seems almost like a cop out um, because we said that baby universes couldn't exist for the same reason that we couldn't test them um, and therefore like not see whether the information is still there. So how does this idea differ from that? The complaint you make is a reasonable one. Even if we can't do an experiment that can see this contradiction with the no cloning theorem, you might want to insist anyway that there still really is a contradiction. Whether you do this is a bit of a philosophical choice. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit like asking if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Except in this case, it's if a quantum mechanical rule is broken uh, and there's no one there to, to measure that, is it really broken? Does it matter? The answer to this question is sort of up to interpretation and there really isn't a consensus yet. Although I should say that there is a clear advantage to this picture over the, over the idea of baby universes. Here the information is actually guaranteed to return to the outside observer. Whereas on the other hand, in the case of baby universes, the information would never return to the observer. So if we want to believe that the information gets out, we should definitely prefer black hole complementarity to baby universes. Black hole complementarity is a strange idea, um, and it's not fully understood. But it seems to be one of the best attempts so far to enable information to escape in the Hawking radiation. Unfortunately, it leads to other problems. These problems stem from one of the weird features of quantum mechanics, entanglement. You may have learned about this in the last episode of Black Hole Wars. We don't have time to describe what entanglement is in full detail, but you can think of it as a kind of property that connects the different parts of a system. When two objects are entangled, this means that observations of one object inevitably have an impact on the other object. The rules of quantum mechanics play an important role in determining which objects uh, are entangled in which ways. Physicists have used these rules to, to explore the entanglement of the bits of information around a black hole, 
and they found that the rules have several important consequences. The first consequence is that if a photocopier on the horizon duplicates information into two copies, then the copy on the inside of the black hole has to be entangled with the copy that escapes in the radiation on the outside. And it's very hard to avoid this. One of the ways you could try to avoid it is to make the photocopier defective, meaning it's unable to copy all of the different types of information that it, it needs to be able to. I'll talk about another way in, in a few minutes. If the photocopier is defective, then surely it's not um, going to actually resolve the information paradox because the information hasn't been copied correctly. That's right. So we need to insist that the photocopier isn't defective, meaning it can copy everything perfectly. The second consequence of the rules of entanglement is that the Hawking radiation that is emitted from the black hole early in its life has to be entangled with the Hawking radiation that it's emitted from the black hole late in its life. If this isn't true, then not all of the information can escape the black hole. So we have three different parts of our system. The inside of the black hole, the early Hawking radiation, and the late Hawking radiation. And they all need to be entangled with each other. But entanglement works in very specific ways, dictated by the strict rules of quantum mechanics. It turns out that quantum mechanical objects are very picky. They can only be entangled with at most one other thing. Clearly, since we have three different parts of our system all entangled with each other, something has to have gone wrong. So the picture we've painted is not consistent with the rules of quantum mechanics even beyond the question of the no-cloning theorem. We'll need to modify it somehow, uh, and there are not many ways to do this. One possibility is to break all of the entanglement between the inside of the black hole and the Hawking radiation. But this is actually very difficult, and we'd need a really huge amount of energy to do it. Putting all of this energy into the system would cause something dramatic to happen, an incredibly hot, burning wall of fire would appear on the horizon. This is called the firewall proposal, and it's quite controversial. It seems very strange that such a violent object would have to just suddenly appear floating in empty space, and we've never observed anything like this. The existence of a firewall would even break the equivalence principle that underlies gravity, which was described in the early episodes of this series. Yeah, so the equivalence principle says to us that um, a, a, any observer, um, regardless of whether they're falling in a black hole, um, as long as they're in this state of what we call free fall, um, it's not different from another observer. Uh, and this is a very fundamental thing in relativity. And uh, this, as Josh said, is a perfect example of how um, quantum mechanics and general relativity don't speak the same language. Exactly. This is an example of how the prediction coming from gravity, that there's nothing special about a free-falling observer at the horizon, is in sharp disagreement with what quantum theory seems to predict, that there is a firewall. In many ways, this proposal raises more questions than it answers. The last thing we'll discuss is one of the most recent developments in the field of black hole information. It involves some fascinating ideas, and it's excited a lot of physicists. Remember that when two objects are entangled with each other, observations of one object have an impact on the other. And there's another way this can happen in physics that doesn't have to involve entanglement, and it's so obvious it seems silly to point it out. We could just put the objects next to each other. Then if we disturb one of the objects, maybe by knocking it, it'll move about a little and bump into the one next to it. At first, this seems like a pretty mundane observation, but it's been suggested that it's not a coincidence. In particular, it's been suggested that the entanglement between two objects is somehow exactly the same thing as their proximity in space. But George, how can this possibly be? Because we know from a very famous thought experiment from the 20th centuries that two particles that are entangled can be at the very large distances at each other. And this is actually what Einstein called the spooky 
actioner distance. So how can it be that entanglement is equivalent to objects being close to each other then? The idea is that when we entangle these two objects, we have to at the same time create a wormhole that connects them together. You can think of a wormhole as a kind of tube in space-time that joins two different regions. So actually by creating this wormhole you are putting the two objects close to each other even though we can't perceive the wormhole and to us it looks like the objects are very far away from each other. Yeah, uh, so when two small objects are entangled the wormhole between them is very thin so it's very hard to see. The wormhole only becomes easy to see when we take two objects with a large amount of information in them and entangle all of the information in one object with all of the information in the other. It gets wider and so it's bigger so it's easier to see, or at least that's the idea. Josh, there's been a lot of um, talk in um, popular science articles about teleportation and um, this is obviously relevant uh, to uh, the, the, these ideas that you've been talking about in terms of entanglement. Um, could you maybe talk about that a bit more? Yeah, um, so quantum teleportation is the name given to a kind of computer algorithm that can only be run on a quantum computer. You give to the algorithm uh, two entangled objects and then it's able to transfer information from one of those objects to the other object almost instantaneously. You could say that the information is teleported. This is sort of mysterious and hard to understand unless you know a lot about quantum mechanics. But this picture with wormholes might make it easier to see what's happening. If when two objects are entangled there's a wormhole in between them, then all of the information that you want to transfer can simply travel through the wormhole from one object to the other. The idea is that this is actually what's going on uh, when, when information is teleported with quantum teleportation. There's a lot of evidence that something like this has to happen in quantum gravity, but we don't fully understand how just yet. In fact, this fits into a larger set of ideas that the fabric of space-time itself is built up from all of the different ways in which objects can be entangled with each other. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So um, how does this go on to apply to the black hole information paradox? Can it help us resolve it now? It does. Remember that if we want to avoid the existence of a firewall, the bits of information inside and outside of the black hole have to be entangled with each other. So if the wormhole entanglement connection is real, then this implies that there's some kind of wormhole that connects the inside and the outside of the black hole. If this is the case, then maybe someone on the outside can just peer through that wormhole and see everything on the inside and in that way, just recover all of the information that fell in. Until fairly recently, this was a, quite a wild idea, and it was hard to understand mathematically. However, a series of calculations have shown that in certain special cases, something very much like this does happen. In particular, after enough Hawking radiation has been emitted from the black hole, an outside observer can use a kind of wormhole to peer inside of it. The part of the inside of the black hole that the observer can see has come to be known as the island. The island starts off very small, but as time goes on it grows larger and larger so we can see more and more of the information in the black hole. There have been lots of recent advancements in this way of thinking about black hole information that have excited the theoretical physics community. And of course, like everything else we've discussed today, um, this idea has its drawbacks, and physicists disagree about how exactly we should interpret the entanglement wormhole connection, um, and whether or not an island will appear in general. This is a really active field of research at the moment, and I'm, I'm quite keen to see where it leads. Yeah, so I guess to sum up, um since Hawking um, developed his original calculations which led to the black hole information paradox there's been a lot of new profound ideas in theoretical physics and 
a multitude of potential resolutions have been suggested. It, in this podcast, um, we've discussed the main ones, and Josh has um, uh, given quite a lot of detailed uh, ex- explanations about those. But there's still many others out there, and you can learn about some of those in the next episode, episode five of the Black Hole. Before ending, uh, I want to go back to that poll from 1993. I was attending an online conference last year, and a similar poll with the same question was taken by Ahmed Almeri. Here are the results of that one. And here's a table that compares the two polls. It's interesting to see how things have changed. In some ways, we've made progress in reaching a consensus, Support for information comes out has grown, while the number who hold that information is lost has dropped. But in other ways, we've made the opposite of progress. The support for something else has more than doubled. And this just goes to show that despite decades of research, the black hole information paradox is still very much an open problem. Maybe we already have the beginnings of the answer, we just haven't been able to reach a consensus. Or maybe the solution is something completely unexpected, using physics we just don't understand yet. In either case, there's still much research to be done, and I'm looking forward to the discoveries that are made in the future. So this has been episode four of Black Hole Wars at the Cambridge Festival, brought to you by Angeron Tavanesan, Biliana Tomova, and Josh Kirklin. If you like the talk, you might want to check out all the other episodes. Thank you for watching, and good night.